Boys, how are we doing? Ready for another podcast? Big MT. We um we had a massive offline discussion because I normally go through the questions with you and we kind of just decipher which order we're going to do them in and we're just all across the questions. And um, we had like a half an hour podcast. We did a podcast before the podcast. <laughs> so um, That was probably my fault, sorry. Yeah, okay. We love it, we love it, so we love we're it. We're probably going to repeat ourselves, but let's just get straight into it um, and start off with the first question. So which is the one that we had a lot of lot of discussion about before we even hit the record button. But the first question was, why does someone in peak week, when they consume more food, they still don't gain weight? So I think they're referring to like when someone is like been dieting down a fair bit, maybe been doing a ton of steps, ton of cardio, been on really, really low calories. And then all of a sudden they're trying to carb up and they're carving up on ridiculous amounts of carbohydrates and they're just not gaining weight. It's just not sticking and it's really not um, not filling them out. So I know, Scotty, this is up your alley from a um, scientific perspective. So, and you had a lot to say about it offline. So I'll get you just to repeat yourself. That's all good. Um, yeah, so we spoke about, firstly, if you, if you have the view and that we, we constantly refer back to you, that the human body is dying, is, de, is dying, is designed to acclimate to what it's exposed to. So as humans, we're designed to survive, to adapt. So in a contest prep, typically, obviously, where we're going to be dieting down on lower calories because that's how we obviously um, we induce fat loss. But macronutrient splits that tend to favor a low carbohydrate, which again is pretty common, low carbohydrate, potentially even low fat, and then just relatively high protein um, diet for an extended period of time, it changes in terms of the way that your body partitions and oxidizes energy. So we take in carbohydrate, we take in protein, we take in fats. So the pathway in terms of how we actually oxidize, I'm taking in carbohydrate, how my body metabolizes it. So it breaks down that glucose, it's ingested and basically converts it to, to ATP. So the, the process in which that follows is going to change. So for example, if I'm consuming a low carbohydrate diet, and a high protein, high fat diet, then my body will become very efficient at oxidizing lipids. So breaking down fats that we ingest and then converting that to ATP, which is the body's um, energy source for fuel. So if you spend a large amount of time not consuming very much carbohydrate, and we, we refer to it as the term is when you go down the rabbit hole, you suck down super low, body composition is low. And as we've alluded to um, as naturals, the lean that we get, our nutrient partitioning, so the body's ability to be able to ingest food and send it and utilize it as we need, it tends to, um, to down-regulate because we're just not as efficient at doing that, which is why a lot of naturals who have access to pharmacology are able to, to use that to their advantage. Now, going back to what we were talking about before, when, when you're not consuming a lot of carbohydrate, you're super lean, you're perhaps very, very active and you're doing... Um, you're still training and you might be doing 12 to 15,000 steps, whatever it is in this case that we were talking about. And then after three or four weeks, you decide now I'm just going to load and I'm going to push carbohydrate. You're now trying to switch to a substrate that your body isn't familiar with and it hasn't become efficient at oxidizing because it hasn't had to because you've been, you've been spending so much time in lipolysis, so breaking down lipid um, and oxidizing it to fuel your energy demands. So what happens is when you introduce this carbohydrate and typically it's normally in large amounts, the goal of pushing that carbohydrate in is obviously to fill out the muscle. So we're storing carbohydrate in our liver and we're storing it obviously in, um, in, in our muscles, muscle glycogen stores. Now, typically most people, let's say adults, anywhere from 80 to 100 grams of glycogen will be stored in the liver. And then depending on the human, most people, 300 to sort of 500 grams unless they're a large human, you know, everyone's different. There's no blanket statement that MG, because he's an absolute Tyrannosaurus, he's got all this muscle, he can hold 900 grams of glycogen within his muscle tissue, whereas someone like me, who's not as muscly and, and handsome and bald as Michael Galanti, <laughs> perhaps can't hold That's as much right. glycogen within my frame, I might, I might be able to achieve muscle glycogen saturation on, on a smaller intake. So... It's very individualized, but regardless, and this is for females, if you're taking in, say, 
three or 400 grams for multiple days, you should be able to, to achieve muscle glycogen saturation. Now, if you can't, the likelihood is that, again, your body isn't going to be efficient. So firstly, if you think that you can go from just being all on one side and then just all of a sudden switching, which does actually happen, and we use this protocol with endurance athletes where they'll actually train on lower carbohydrate availability so that they can become efficient at using fats. And then typically on a race day or game day, you're pushing carbohydrates so that they're able to use that substrate. But then when they empty those stores, they're really efficient at using fats. But as a physique athlete, you kind of have to have, and this is why we speak about the importance of in, of in keeping in some carbohydrate and utilizing refeeds, spending time at maintenance when we get very lean, because otherwise not only do we change the way in which we use certain substrates to oxidize and how we become efficient at using them, but obviously, we, we lose the ability to be able to top up muscle glycogen stores. And we, we, we lose, the I guess, the, the gauge on how long is it going to take. Like, if, you, if you've been running 30 or 40 low days in a row, and then three days out, you're just going to backload and think that everything's going to go great. Like, you, you're absolutely kidding yourself. So ideally, the weeks before, you should have had at least two or three refeeds, gauging and assessing. You know, MT, you're a perfect example, like, did you, did you have trial peaks before you actually had your VIX peak? The first ever one? Let's talk about the VIX peak that, that we managed to nail. What happened the week before? What was done? Uh, we, we, I think we ran three trials or two or three trials before we even done the actual peak week. And every single time we found that, oh, we, we've got to push, we've got to push more up, in. Yeah. We've got to push more in. And then we found where it needed to be. And every time we did it, the body responded better. Right. And had we not have had that information to be able to go into that peak, you, you, you're essentially driving blind because you don't really know. Well, not only that, that information, but giving the body the opportunity to, to know how to switch to that source and then um, store it. Because yeah. I've been so depleted for so long and been doing one way for so long low carbohydrate a lot of steps a lot of cardio you know it's all about fat loss fat loss fat loss as we're saying with this example that these questions come come out with is why why all of a sudden can't someone all these carbs that someone's putting in why aren't they sticking right because you know, they haven't they haven't done it in a long time so mm-hmm. you're right, like with our clients i know all of us boys do this maybe two three weeks out we might give them a refeed like we would for a, a show day for a peak week so that we can see how things um, how things go, but also give the body opportunity to, to know how to switch. So when we do that switch again, it's like, oh, I just did this a couple of weeks ago. I know what I need to do here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would love to raise a couple of points as well, which is like um, if, I, if I look at myself as an example, I was able to fill out in one and a half days. But I, I'll tell you the difference between me. Scott, pretty, Scott had me at maintenance for the three weeks leading up to show, right? So my carbohydrate intake was quite high, and this is obviously specific to me. So my ability to utilize those carbs when when comp day came around was very, very easily because I'd been accustomed to it for weeks. Mm -hmm. And I just think sometimes one day or one high day when you've been 30 or 40 low days is also not going to be enough for you to be able to become accustomed to that. Then there's the other side to it, which we see all the time. And guys, us three as coaches, I can guarantee if you get a peak week plan from us, we will be very specific in the amount of expenditure we are looking for you to have on your peak week, right? So we might say, okay, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, steps from 12,000 to nine to seven to 6,000. But what happens with a lot of people is they're taking in all this food and their energy is, you know, a little bit higher. They're not filling out, but their energy is higher because of the instant gratification, like the instant filling they get. So they do like double the steps that they've been doing in prep, which is, again, burning all of that energy that they're trying to intake, right? So... Or the coach hasn't told them to back off the steps. Spot and they on. think, oh, well, I'm eating more. I should do more, shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah. But the, the coach might say, hey, pull cardio. Oh, cool. I've pulled cardio. So I'm not sitting on the bike for 45 minutes. But I did 25,000 steps instead of 14. Hmm. Okay, but you did way more than the 45 minutes on the bike anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think we were talking about this offline too, Scott, is trying to carb load someone but still but not backing off their activity. And what and essentially is happening there, 
And that was all we were talking about. So if you're ingesting all this carbohydrate, but you're still doing a shitload of, of steps, like typically some people will have to do 12, even I've, I've heard of people doing upwards of, and of, of like up to 20,000 steps, which when you're doing that amount of steps, I don't care what anyone says, that's not neat. That's intended exercise. So people get so confused with that. Like it's just, it's a nice metric that we can keep, I guess, miscellaneous movement. But if you're going for a walk to get steps, you're, you're going for a walk. Like that isn't miscellaneous movement. You, you've chosen to, to go and do that. So if not you're cardio, doing, man. It's not cardio. <laughs> if you're doing 20,000 steps or 15,000, whatever it is, but then you're also trying to push carbohydrate in, then you might have scaled back and let's say that you were doing a light glucose transport session and then you stopped doing your cardio. But if you're still doing 15, 20,000 steps, you're typically going to get quite a lot of energy expenditure. And a lot of times you will get a, a, an upregulation in miscellaneous movement because you've got more energy availability. You've gone from being a corpse to just now you've got energy. But by doing that, it's the, the simplest way to explain is you're filling up a cup of water and then you want, to, you want to rock up on show day with that cup being as full as you can. So your muscles are as full as they can with glycogen. But if you're walking and you're moving around, all you're doing is tipping water out. And then the next day you do the same thing again and then you're wondering why it doesn't work. Like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. So you've got the, the issue that you haven't used carbohydrate as a regular substrate. So your body isn't familiar or as efficient at oxidizing it or storing it. And we've spoken why it's important to, to have that and to have those those refeed days because it just lets you know, like you might run two refeeds at three weeks out and you might get biofeedback that, oh, my workouts were still shit, didn't get a pump, my weight pretty much dropped and I feel flat. If that's the case, then you just didn't top up the tanks. So then typically if that was me, I'd be like, all right, well, for the next two days, we're going to push in X amount or you might run two more low days, go back to baseline, and then let's run a three-day, but let's bring food up at this point because we need to get an idea of exactly what does it take to bring you back to life. Mm -hmm. And if you wait until the last week to pull that to pull that trigger and to play that card, then you, for me, it's just way too risky. You invest so much time into it, you're leaving it up to chance. You don't want to wake up on show day, and this is what old school bros would do, and go and run to the mirror like, fuck, how am I going to look? You should know when you go to bed, I'm going to look crazy when I wake up because I know I've done everything that I, that I needed to do. And typically, if you've, if you've topped up carbs, right, you should actually potentially even be able to spill a day out or pull back the day before because you know that you've achieved muscle glycogen saturation. If you do nothing and you're relaxing the day before a show like you should be, then you shouldn't need a ton of food because you're going to be virtually sedentary for the whole day. You go get your tan, you walk to the kitchen. You know, you're basically just trying to hold what you have so that on day you press play, you start pumping up, all that carbohydrate is there when you need it. Mm -hmm. But if you're leaving it to the last minute, then for me, you just haven't periodized your, your peaking strategy and potentially even your whole fat loss um, approach. Granted, there are like rules to the exception where if you're not lean enough for peak week and you're trying to get leaner, then that's a risk that you play because... At the end of the day, there's no point picking someone if they're, they're still two to three kilos over stage weight. Yeah. But we're talking about someone that's in condition and it's ready to rock. It's a fine line. And too many people dig too far towards the very end when they forget that you need to give back to the system. Because as you get very lean, especially as naturals, the risk of losing lean mass, like you might lose, oh, I lost another 500 grams in peak week. 100 grams of that might have been fat. For 400 grams, that might have been muscle. Mm. You've got to look at the, tr the trade-off for that. And typically, in an ideal world, like we spoke about with UMG, you're ready early, you can bring food back up so that you can protect training performance, but also so that you can look at your peaking strategy through a clearer lens versus just guesstimating. Yeah. Yeah. I think we nailed that one. Yeah. I think we're good. Uh, the other question that we um, we kind of spoke about in our offline podcast <laughs> was um, was the off-season questions that we got. So we got a lot of questions about off-season um, and they were training, nutrition related and also related to different phases that you go through in the off-season. So 
I'll try to combine the three questions into one and we can just kind of discuss it. Um, so one part of the question was, um, when in your off season, do you, from a training perspective, do you look at increasing volume, increasing load, a bit of both? And how do you, how does that coincide with nutrition? So there's that component. So it's more of a training component. And the other, the other bit was, how do you know if your calories in the off season are too high or too low? So how, how do you know if you're pushing enough or, or not enough? Yep. Um, and then the other part was, do we ever take breaks from bulking, from being in a surplus? Yeah. Do you want to tackle it, MG? Yeah, so there's obviously a, a few parts to it. And we like I'll, I'll give you like a short answer and then we can kind of um, break them each down individually. So like in terms of like the training part, increasing volume or load is probably more of a thing that's just done on a weekly basis, right? So I'm just looking for overall volume accumulation to increase week to week. Now, that can be in a number of ways, as obviously everyone knows is like that can just be additional reps. It can be load. It can be both. And then there's things like, okay, we we feel like we've kind of run our race with that, right? So we've we've maxed out the amount of load we're feeling like we can get on this particular exercise, starting to feel really, really difficult. We're doing a reasonable amount of sets already, so we're not looking at adding sets. So then we might add in other ways of accumulating overload, things like pauses, rest pauses, tempos, pulses, these types of things. So I don't have a like a set blanket rule for when I introduce each of those because it's definitely athlete dependent, but I'm definitely looking at things on a sort of five to seven week basis as a, as a rough guide. The second part to that would be like the, how do I know if I'm eating too much? Simple answer is just looking at your rate of gain, right? We're looking to achieve a certain rate of gain per week, per athlete. And again, everyone's going to be different. And the amount of food and Scott touched on this earlier. There's no like blanket to that, right? And to make it even harder, that amounts a moving target all the time, right? So like the amount that you start your bulk on in eight weeks is probably not going to be the same amount that your bulk needs to be on now, right? Because you've customized to it. You've probably added a little bit of muscle tissue. Your, your metabolic rate's increasing. So it's also a moving target. But I would say as, as a rough guide, let's just use you know someone who might be 75 kilos as an example a 75 kilo male athlete you know i'm looking for something like three to 700 grams i know that's a big range but again it's athlete dependent as a rate of gain per week for it to fit in there so that i know that the plan and the current nutrition system that we're using is being effective if it's well above that or it's going backwards then the system's telling you it needs to be um, adjusted or rectified um, and again, there's there's obviously lots of different factors that will go into that. And I'll use myself as a really good example this week. I messaged Scott because I had a wedding on Saturday, on Friday, sorry, which, you know, my food for the rest of the week was absolutely spot on. Everything was was perfect. And even on that day, I got a shitload of food in before I went to the wedding, right? I knew that it was going to be difficult to eat. So I ate a shitload before. I was so full when I got there. But I ate so much. I was dancing. I was active. The meals were smaller, and I woke up like 1.2, 1.3 kilos lighter. So, so there's there's still going to be things that come into it that need to be addressed individually, um, but definitely using rate again is a really good system. Yeah. So, just quickly, I'll, I'll try to be concise with my answer too. Is from the training component. Yeah, you're always doing both. You're looking for some kind of overload, right? So whether you're overloading volume, overloading load itself, uh, or using intensity techniques, you want to go through phases. So normally, you know, programs are going to last between six, eight, or 12 weeks, and they're normally dedicated to overloading in one of those components or maybe many of those components. So in the off-season, you should be going through, um, should be sticking to programs for, a, for an extended period of time, six, eight, 12 weeks. And, um, and they should have specific goals of progression and overload, right? Um, like what you said with, um, with nutrition. So, yeah, you want to, it's off-season. You should be gaining, right? Your rate of gain is going to be different for everyone. But normally if you're coaching yourself or, or you're running things yourself or maybe you're working with a coach, you know, typically what you're going to do is you're going to slowly increment, incrementally um, increase food until at a slow 
So you have a nice rate of gain. When you hit a plateau, you increase a bit more. When you hit a plateau, you increase a bit more and so on and so forth until maybe you get to a level where now you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable um, from a body fat, body image perspective. Now, everyone's level of discomfort will be different. Um, and that's when maybe you introduce things that you're not in a surplus anymore and maybe you're doing a fat loss phase or a mini cut. So, But normally I wouldn't interrupt that growth phase or that surplus phase um, anything less than three to four months. Like I want to see a good 12, 16 or more weeks of us pushing one direction before we go, okay, let's do a mini cut now. Like if you're doing a mini cut every eight weeks, it's pointless, right? You want to get through that. Because you've got to remember, muscle gain takes longer, right, than fat loss. So you need to be doing that for a longer period of time than you would be doing a fat loss phase. Like a fat loss phase lasts for four, six, eight, 12 weeks max, right, unless it's a comp prep. Um, but a growth phase shouldn't be anything shorter than 16 weeks before you then decide, okay, should we do a little bit of a deficit to kind of bring off some fluff to make you feel comfortable? And I'm, I work with majority females, right? So that's going to be more often than maybe a male because a male's like, yeah, just get huge. Just eat heaps of shit. And they probably don't ever feel uncomfortable. They probably feel even more comfortable as they get bigger. Whereas a female, maybe from a motivation perspective, body image, they want to do that little fluff cut, right? Um, because it will motivate them to keep pushing for another 16 weeks or more to get them through the next phase, right? So sometimes if everyone's just a robot and it's perfect, we'd love to do it all one way. But some, we're dealing with individuals, right? So sometimes we need to say, okay, if it's going to motivate you to push another 16 weeks, if we have a mini cut now, then let's do the mini cut now. So, so in saying that, we want to make sure we do we push in one direction for an extended period of time because muscle growth takes longer. So we want to make sure we give it a chance to actually work and do something before we switch something out. Yeah. And um, that's normally how we do it. Now, look, if you're someone that's trying to roll around into a prep and – um, maybe competing every year, every season B, season B, season B, season B, or season A, maybe you might have that chat with that client and say, look, let's just wait for a mini cut until we, or let's just wait for the fat loss phase until prep starts because we've got some work to do and we really need to keep pushing cows and pushing that growth, and get the most out of the off season because we don't have as much time as if someone was competing every two to three years when we can go through this phasic approach. So, it depends on what the bigger picture is. And then some people have like, I don't know, a wedding or an overseas trip and they want to get, you know, a little bit shredded. So the way you plan out a season uh, or a year can depend on a lot of factors. But I think if you're a true competitor and true athlete, you want to try to push the off season as much as you possibly can and get the, mo the most out of it um, and be as most, much robotic as possible. <laughs> than uh, implementing phases that really are just to appease someone's um, image yeah. of themselves. What about like maybe something good for Scott? Scott, what would be like um, some reasons why we would employ, say, a mini cut or a break from bulking other than the reasons me and MT have mentioned? Oh, yeah. One of the big ones is actually to, to resensitize hunger. So mm -hmm. typically... Girls probably don't have as much of an issue because they're typically not having to push as high food up. But like, let's say if, if I use myself for an example, the last probably seven, eight months pushing in 4,800 to 5,200 um, calories most days, you're literally waking up full as full can be. Like you've just eaten at a buffet and then you've got to force feed it a 1,200 calorie breakfast, which people are like, oh my God, that would be amazing. Do it for a <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Do it for a week, it's hard. Do it for a month and then do it for six months. It just sucks. Like to be honest, I, I prefer I would prefer dieting than the very, very back ends of force feeding because you just you don't look forward to any meal at all because you're literally eating because you have to. Now everyone's gonna be different in terms of how much, and in no way am I saying again, blanket statement rule, you've got to eat five thousand calories, because if I could eat three and a half thousand calories. Or maybe probably four thousand. If I'm honest, four thousand, and I could forever make crazy progress, and I'd have a nice rate of gain. I wouldn't eat any more than that because that's a good amount of food where I just feel like I can enjoy whatever I want. I can have plenty of volume, eat the foods I like. But when you're going that extra twelve hundred calories further, 
it's just not a good time. And again, if I compare that to say, what am I? I think I'm five or six weeks into this um, pre-prep fat loss phase and going from where my food was to where it is now, I look forward to every meal. I come home of an evening and I'm like, I can't wait to eat. I'm, I'm actually hungry. Whereas in July, August, like I would look at it and be like, fucking hell, I'm going to have to eat all of that. And then know that in eight hours time, I'm going to have to eat again. So resensitizing hunger is a big thing. And sometimes um, I'll do that with more so with my guys where it might be like we'll run a three week, not even so much a mini cut phase. It's more of a resensitize where if their food's high four thousands or even just, I've got some guys that find it hard to eat high three thousands where for three weeks we'll pull full, we'll, we'll pull food back by say maybe 1500 calories, something really drastic, which you might be like, well, that's pretty extreme, but the idea of it, yeah, we'll get some fat loss, but it's more, we need something extreme to be able to cause a shift and change that so that we do resensitize hunger. So when we bring food back in, it's like, yeah, now I'm actually ready to eat again. And typically for most people, it takes, I've found for guys, if you're eating a lot for a consistent amount of time, it's going to take at least three weeks before you start to get some of that hunger signaling back where you're actually looking forward to your next meal. And in no way, shape or form, am I saying that you're like obsessed? Like I don't, look at food or watch TV and be like, oh, look at that pancake or whatever. You just simply kind of look forward to eating now versus before you don't. Yeah. Is, is there anything other than hunger for the reasons that you would take it off? So what I'm saying is maybe your body composition is getting a little bit out of whack. Yeah. So, so or maybe the, the pathway for gains needs to needs a rest. <clears throat> so typically like the, this sort of information will normally leave clues. So in, if your check-in spreadsheet is sort of designed how it should be, so if someone, let's say that through the qualitative metrics, they're like, digestion's crap, I'm always full, I don't have any desire to eat, okay, that's a red flag, we might need to look at it. Body composition is perhaps at its highest, so reducing and running a cleanup phase is obviously something that we need to do because as important as it is to gain some weight, hold on, I'm going to cough otherwise. <laughs> too much talking on huh? drink my drink um, as important as it is to eat to gain weight so we can perform optimally in the gym we sort of have I refer to it as like a bandwidth so we kind of have a threshold where and typically we'll set it once we mini cut it could be like I don't know once we get down to X amount of weight we want to probably give ourselves at least six to eight months before we have to go down this path again. That gives us about eight kilos of weight that we can gain. We don't want to gain that back in two, three months. So you're putting in place a, a rate of gain bandwidth, so to speak, rather than just a weekly or monthly per amount. So that's important because if we get too far away from our striking distance, like if you compete at 70 kilos and you're 100 kilos in the off season, you're just too fat. And you think about it, you start prep that heavy. Even if you started prep it, like, let's say UMT, where you had to lose over 20, what was it, 20? 20 kilo. That's huge. Whereas, obviously, the next time you compete, if you only have to start prep with 12 or 14 kilos, so much easier to, to be able to, to, to do that. So, fat loss is a, obviously a useful tool. And typically, if we see a massive drop in training performance where it's like you're eating heaps, all those other things are being ticked off and we're not seeing a progression from training anymore, then trying to clean up phase but again we want to get in and then get out you don't want to hang out in that um in that in that suboptimal environment for long awesome makes sense makes total sense um similar on a similar topic someone's talking about refeeds so they said uh why would you have one free re refeed a week uh compared to spreading it out over the whole week so for instance they said a 700 calorie refeed versus seven 100 calorie days where you just added 100 calories each day. Why would you do the refeed over just having a small, small adding adding that refeed across the seven days of the week? Scott, Scott is left to go have a refeed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just taking in some carbs. No, sorry. I, I, I would say like the simple answer for me would be like I get that the calorie amount is the <laughs> For me, it's really about performance. Mm. 
Look, the difference you're going to feel from a, and this is, <laughs> this is, this would be a big refeed for anyone, a 700 gram carb refeed, like unless you're like a, a, a larger open sort of male bodybuilder. Having said that, there's I've got a couple of females that can put down quite a bit of carb on a, on a refeed day, but the performance you're going to have from one 700 gram hit on that session versus you know incrementally adding 100 grams each day, that's probably where you're going to get the, the biggest benefit from. They said they said cows, but that's okay. But yeah, oh, having right. increase, that's okay. So yeah, even less. So 100. Let's just say 100 100 cows is 25 gram of carb, right? Yeah. You're going to feel that 25 gram of carb across seven days versus. What would 700 cows in, in carbs be in one hit? What does that work out to be? Well, yeah, times, times it by seven, so. There you go. So like a hell of a lot more, right? So you're definitely going to feel the benefit of that in one hit than you would uh, from a training perspective. Um, a little bit of additional sort of um, saturation of glycogen within the muscle. That, that, would be, that would be the main difference, I'd say. Uh, I'd say it depends on someone's lifestyle too. Yeah. So, for instance, if someone can be like, I'll eat the same thing every day and I can be pretty consistent Monday to Sunday, they're like, cool, all right, we can, we can do it that way. But if they're like, oh, you know what, I just love having a high day. Just lo- it just allows me to maybe have a little more food, maybe cook a bigger, bigger dinner with my partner, or whatever, or my family, whatever it may be. So some people want it from a lifestyle perspective. Um, I don't know whether it's going to make a massive difference from a metabolism. If it's just one refeed day, it's probably more of a psychological sure, yeah. or, um, or lifestyle benefit than a physiological benefit. I guess maybe if you had that refeed on a day prior or the day of a, a weak point training day, it could help with gains. Um, but I'd probably more look at multiple day refeeds not doing 700 calories on one day and having that across three days, you're probably going to see more of a psychological and physiological benefit, to be honest, um, from a metabolism perspective, training performance. Um, that's how I that's how I would do it. And also, too, is when you're saying, should I spread it out just 100 calories each day, is sometimes people's level of accuracy in tracking is off by 100 calories. So it's like, Maybe they're not even they're not even yeah, um, they're utilizing it because they're just tra- their tracking is off. And also in the off season, people's tracking is a is a little bit slack. Um, not for us ha- hardcore people, of course. But um, also we allow a range, like you know, plus or minus five ten grams of protein, carbs, fats. So you're going to be out of whack by hundred calories anyway. Sometimes just within your tracking. So you probably want to ensure if you do want to have a surplus um, and you find that your rate of gain is is not where it needs to be or you're just plateauing and maintaining weight, then maybe introducing a multiple day refeed to help bring the whole weekly surplus up might help instead of just adding in 100 calories and then someone's not tracking it accurately and really not really adding in 100 at all. They could be underestimating. Yeah. What do you think, Scotty? Yeah. Everything you guys said is is uh, pretty spot on. But in terms of, look, there's actually the, the Jackson Pios did his um, his the ice cap study on refeeds, and that it used to be just, I guess, not not a theory, but just uh, there was minimal research around that space. And this was a huge, um, it was a huge trial that just basically kind of debunked the whole refeeds promote fat loss. Basically, as you said, all they really do is attenuate some of that psychological, um, I guess, build up that comes with dieting. So I know if it was me, if I had five days at 2000, but I had then two refeeds at 2800, I would rather do that than just run 2200 seven days a week. And in a lot of ways as well, you'll, you'll see it promote and up regulation in adherence as a result of that because <coughs> they've got these, I'm just going to make it through till Friday and then I know I've got two days of more food, sleep will be better, training performance is normally better and that's another reason that we use them and typically we'll periodize them around. Perhaps you might have your biggest workout for the day on a Saturday. So you may refeed on a Thursday and a Friday. Now people might be like, why wouldn't you do it on the day that you're consuming it? The day that you're training the nutritional status of your muscle is going to be 
um, basically dependent on what was consumed within the previous 48 hours. So if I want to train Unreal tomorrow, I've got a really big day, then perhaps it makes sense to top up on everything the day prior. So we, we use that as well to help protect training performance, which is one of our biggest tools that we have at our disposal to retain lean tissue in the dieting condition. Um, but yeah, there's no right or wrong way. It's just individual preference. How do you, you want to do it? I'm yet to meet someone that would rather just have 150 calories or 200 calories more each day than have one or two days at a higher intake. Um, I'm probably one of those people, <laughs> to be honest, especially during prep, not in off-season. I think off-season a little bit different. In prep, I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. Like I didn't want to have to adjust to my food. Like I want to be like, what am I doing for the next seven days or more? You're also one in a million that just is very, very comfortable living uncomfortable in the dieting condition. Yeah, exactly. Like I just don't give a shit. Just whatever. No. Just, I'll do whatever, whatever I need to do. And what I found is when I was given a refeed, I was hungrier after it. And I was like, I don't want to do – like I don't, I don't want to have to battle, put some more energy towards – not thinking about being hungry. So, um, and it didn't really, I was so much in a deficit that it really, the refeeds weren't long enough or big enough to really help with energy, performance and sleep. It pretty much just stayed the same whether it was a refeed day or not. So I'd rather just sit with it than to think that, oh yeah, refeed's coming, something magical is going to happen and nothing magical ever happened. And that's just me, like, you're right, because other people are different. Some people, they felt refreshed, they felt good, they felt motivated to do another five more low days before they had another two more highs. So it's so individual, and that's why coaching is individual. You know, you can't just give the same program to everyone, right? Absolutely. I, I was like, um, like, agree that, like, nothing magical happened, but for me it was just an opportunity to, like, so experience a different food. So my 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 mindset was like i've got five potato days and two pasta days <laughs> that's just what it was that was my meal plan i had potato and, and, yeah, cool. and yeah. potato and fish on five days and because we pretty much had two high days you know almost i would say like 75 percent of the whole prep so it was just like five potatoes two pastas yeah but i probably wouldn't have wanted any more um novelty than that yeah i get that yeah um Onto a training question. Supersets. Do you superset a compound with an isolation, an isolation with an isolation, or a compound with a compound, or you can do all of them? Yeah, I pretty much, <laughs> I don't really superset a lot, to be honest, man, unless the only time I superset is if, like, just, like, just didn't time my session well, man, and I'm rushing. But even then, I would never, I would never superset a compound with anything. That's just me. Mm -hmm. I think the only things I've supersetted are like biceps, triceps, maybe like laterals, rear delts. If I was like running short on time, but I can tell you now, the only reason I'm ever going to do it is if I literally just am running out of time, or I'm on my phone between sets replying to messages because I'm training at my gym and the clock just beats me. But pretty much the only thing that I program that's together would be just arms, man. I think. So isolation with isolation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, can I just say, and you guys have seen this too, like we've probably had some consults with some new clients who have joined the team from other people who have had like, have you ever had like three compounds try set it that you've seen someone come on board? It's like I was yeah. doing like a squat with a leg press with um, a walking barbell lunges. Yeah, I've seen some dumb Man, stuff. Man, how the fuck did you progress in any of those movements ever? Yeah. Uh, so typically, you know, you would typically see isolation superseded with another isolation. And normally there, it doesn't really have to be a rule of thumb. Like it can be opposing muscles, biceps with triceps, or some people like to smash one muscle and be like superset upright rows with side raises, right? Or two tricep moves together. Two, like it, it can be done, right? There's no rule right or wrong. Um, mm. You just wouldn't stick to one blanket way of doing things all the way through. You'd always do phases of different things. Um, supersetting an isolation first with a compound, I wouldn't do that. I don't think I've ever programmed where you superset them, but we've got programs where you do the isolation first as an exercise and then do the corresponding compound second. So 
you know, leg extensions first and then you do leg press after that. So I've definitely seen that and I've definitely programmed for that too. Whether you would program supersetting a compound with a compound, I haven't done that. And I reckon it would be pretty dumb, especially if you weren't very selective on the ones you did. So like you wouldn't superset a squat and a deadlift because you're going to be so gassed after the squat that you now need to brace your core for the deadlift, but you're huffing and puffing and you're probably going to get an injury, right? Even though they're opposing muscle groups per se, right? I could see it, see a way of trying to convince me that if you superset two compounds and they're two machine related compounds and maybe you were like seated or chest supported or strapped in. So it didn't really require so much stability or bracing like I don't know chest supported row with a seated shoulder press machine. Like, I, yeah, okay. You could convince me that that's an okay superset, but I would say, why not do them separately and try to perform your best at both? If you if you're strapped for time, um, or the pro, either you're strapped for time, so you've got to see what where you're spending all your time, or maybe your program is way too big and way too much, and you try to cram way too much shit into a program when you don't need to, which we've which we've all seen too, and we've had clients that have had programs like that in the past from previous coaches. What do you think, Scotty? Yeah, I agree. I think periodization 101, there must always be a reason behind why you're doing what you're doing. So if you can't rationally justify why you're doing it, why is it there? Typically, supersets are an intensification protocol or, as MG said, um, if you're time poor. But again, a compound with a compound, you just it's just too much. Like Neurally, you're too taxed. Physically, you're too taxed. Like, if you, like you said, a, a squat to a leg press, I don't know how you can expect to get on and what the purpose of that is. If you've just gone within one or two of failure on a squat and then you're going to go and try and do more, it's just a giant set. It just, I don't, yeah, I don't see a lot of purpose in it. It may be like a, you could have a finisher on, say, a leg extension where you're doing, you know, a superset. Um, actually, it's not even a superset. What am I talking about? It's a drop set where you'll do a set of 15 and then do a back off set straight away. But, no, nah, typically just isolation. And as you said, normally agonist, antagonist. So it could be if you're time poor, you might have four sets of arms in and you just do biceps and then you go and do triceps. Yeah. And I could make like one exception to the rule if you're managing an injury. So, for example, um, during prep, we obviously had a bit of a tendinopathy flare up. So we, we actually, but it wasn't, this is, it wasn't a true superset because what we were doing is we'd do a set of, say, seated rows two minute break then we do a set of hamstring kills two minute break because what we're actually trying to do is give the forearm four minutes of rest instead of two minutes of rest mm-hmm. but that's not be a a super set. yeah because the time this the, the rest was still the rest so that that's that's probably one exception but again it's not even a true super set mm-hmm. also too is as coaches i think we're all the same we don't want our clients to be the most hated person in the gym from an etiquette perspective because they're hogging three or four pieces of equipment so I always, I'm really conscious when I program, I'm like, how would you walk through this program and actually perform it in the gym? Because I've seen some programs and I've seen some programs from some really good coaches that sell a high volume of online programs. Um, and one of them has a name that rhymes with something that you sing at Christmas. And, um, and I'm like, this person has never actually executed this program in a gym. Like they haven't thought out how would someone perform this program in a gym? Or that person performing that program is going to be the most hated person because they're hogging three pieces of equipment. So when I do a superset, it's like I would superset tricep extension with the rope with face pull with the rope because you're standing in the one spot using the one equipment and you're going to be there anyways. Or bicep curls with dumbbells and side raises with dumbbells because you're most likely going to be using the same dumbbells. And you're really not going to be hogging much equipment. So, oh, but you've put some I, thought into that, man. What? Wow, I've actually <laughs> got what's happening. My programs. Wow, <laughs> you, you actually individualize. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, we can go off on another tangent of like this exercises that people post on Instagram, and you're like, and they're performing them, and they're showing someone performing them. And you're like, that person could never perform that exercise by themselves in the gym if you put in a program. 
because you're literally lifting the weight onto them or you're literally holding something for them whilst they're doing it. So unless you've got like an awesome gym partner that wants to hold like a band for you or place a weight on your shoulder for you or hold your hand while you're doing it, <laughs> you're not going to put that program in someone's, that exercise in someone's program. So, Are you talking about the single leg BOSU ball iliac pull down? Yeah, where you've got to have like a box balancing on a ball and someone with a band around their hip whilst they're making it glute focused and not using their quads with the landmine press on their shoulder. Like, do, like yeah. just come, come on, guys. And trying to balance chopsticks on your head whilst you... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you forgot about the superset exercise too, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I'll, this is really funny. I, I got a... Um, a client, and I think you guys seen it when she was pumping up backstage. She was doing side raises with dumbbells whilst doing a glute kickback with the band. That was cool. Did you see it? Yeah, yeah, it was Nicola, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Nicola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. yeah it was I was awesome. like, that's the ultimate superset. Yeah, that's a good. That, 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 that you got to. That's been, but, but that's being efficient, right? She's not trying to hit. She's not trying to progressively overload that. That's no, I was like, you need to pump up your, gl- your delts and your glutes. She's like, can I do it like this? And she's like waving her arms, doing crazy. side raises whilst doing a kickback with the with her legs. I was like, yeah, that's that's skills. That's some skills right there for sure. People just want to hear MT call out online coaches. Oh, man. <laughs> that could be multiple podcasts in of itself, but uh, we're not going to spend our energy on calling people out. We're going to spend our energy on educating. Activity, education. And positivity. And big smiles. Ooh, yeah. All right, let's leave it there, boys. Awesome. Um, great chatting as always. I, I, re- I reckon that might have been honestly one of the one of the most informative like podcasts that we've put. We've had a lot of episodes, but that, that had a lot of good information. Yeah, it was pretty and we only really stuck to like three or four topics. Yeah. So yeah. And we got a lot, of, like, a lot out of that one. Um, yeah, and keep the questions coming. We're loving it. Yeah, it's good. And we're all due for a bit of a... So are we going to do a, um, a Prep Coach Podcast Christmas party? I, I was thinking of a gym session. I think we spoke about it, that maybe we do it at uh, Powerhouse in Bayswater. Yeah, that'd be good. So okay. we could pick and maybe... I'm thinking maybe like the weekend... We'll probably have to do it on a Sunday because people are most free on a Sunday um, or on a, on a weekend sometime. Maybe we're thinking like the 10th or 11th of December, but let's just start, uh, let's have a think about it offline and see when everyone's free and we'll, uh, we'll post it out there and just get people to come along to it for sure. It'd be awesome to catch when up. Are we go- when are we all going to Scott's house for dinner? That's, that's the main thing. That's- pizzas. I think it was pizzas, wasn't it, man? That's Scott's, okay, yeah. He's got, a great, he's got a great shop in Monty, actually, I think. Yeah, we do, actually. We do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to have this cleanup phase wrapped up in maybe three weeks. So once that's done, we're on. Definitely. We're on. Yeah, absolutely. Due for it. All right, boys, you uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll chat soon. Take care, guys. Take care, boys.